Uh, a brief intro on Ben. So he has a Master of Architecture from Harvard Graduate School of Design, which I think he finished in 97, maybe I shouldn't hate you, uh, and an undergraduate degree from Berkeley. I've had the distinct pleasure of knowing Ben for a, a number of years. He was a longtime editor of Praxis, um, the architectural journal that I uh, edit. Um, he, I'm not going to go too much into the work um, that he'll be talking about. Um, he's going to focus on a number of projects. And as I introduced for those of you who are here for Tim's lecture, starting off this series, we've asked people this year to really talk about the way that they work as much as focusing on the projects themselves. So. We're going to see lots of sexy projects, but I think in particular Ben's going to be talking about the way that they work, and he has this wonderfully enigmatic lecture title, Handy. Um, we went back and forth with some titles, and he was like, this is too academic. You people in academia, all your lecture titles sound the same. So he came up with this awesome lecture title, so we get to figure out what that means. Um, well, I think we'll hear about kind of translation, uh, drawing, questions of drawing versus production, et cetera. So um, without further ado, uh, Ben Gilmer. Well, I'm Ben Gilmartin, uh, principal at Diller Scafidio and Renfro, and thank you for coming out to hear me speak tonight. That's probably too dark. I think I can, I can do it. Um, Amanda challenged me to talk about process, and I had grand ambitions to bring a lot of stuff out of the archive, and I didn't quite get there, but I will try to uh, craft uh, a story uh, about our, our practice and where it was uh, historically and where it is now and where it's going to. And I call that handy, provisionally. Um, so this is a lecture that attempts to loosely connect the dots between a way of working established by Liz and Rick, who are the founders of Diller, Scafidio, and Renfro now, um, in the early days and three projects today, uh, currently in construction ending with a premonition of uh, future work to come. Um, while a way of hand drawing was one of the uh, original signatures of the practice, or at least drawings that composited image and hand drawing, which I'm calling handy, uh, and this way of working actually still is persistent and active in the generative process of our work, uh, the projects have grown in scope, scale, and complexity, evolving significantly the media of both representation and production. Um, and I want to make a case that there is continuous lineage, a connection of methodology and sensibility. Uh, the question is, what is handiness um, uh, that is characteristic of the early practice of Diller, Scafidio, and Renfro? Um, and how does it underpin our present work today? So in a very short kind of introduction, I'll look at some very old work, or relatively old work, going up into the early 2000s. Um, and then I'll jump forward to the present and try and uh, make that connection. And uh, some of you in the audience may be able to you know, help me think about handiness, because this is the first time I'm kind of putting it out there. Uh, I'd start with uh, just a quick slide. Uh, this is not the work of Diller Scafidio. And Renfro, uh, it's um, on the left is Frank Geary's uh, hand. And uh, I think in the architectural uh, community, there's a sense of mystique around the hand of the architect and the way that it kind of performs uh, to, to create or produce ideas. Uh, so that's uh, Geary's Bill Bow, a kind of like unbridled, uninhibited, totally immediate extension of his imagination onto the page. Um, after which all the work that's done is an attempt to adapt that to program and site uh, in some way that, that makes it relevant to the place where the building lives. Um, and on the right, Preston Scott Cohen, probably indicative of Eisenman and perhaps Liebenskind or others, um, kind of the opposite, a kind of a way of working and drawing that's incredibly labor intensive, where, where the layers upon layers of projection, starting perhaps in the program or the site, uh, kind of sequentially and progressively distance the work from that in order to kind of create a defamiliarization, a kind of distantiation, uh, in the hopes of uh, 
becoming increasingly unencumbered with the, the conventions of architecture and through this kind of meditative act of drawing upon drawing upon drawing, the toil brings you to something new. Um, I would say that by contrast or comparison, this is the slow house by Diller Scafidio. Um, there's something about it which is completely literal. It's neither a total outpouring of intuition or instinct like Frank Geary, nor something that's enigmatic through the kind of layering of drawing. It does have traces of its making. Um, but it's a kind of literal act of choreography and a record of performance, um, an act undertaken at a real site looking for the most reductive, most essential means of collapsing an idea with its mechanisms of production. The concept collapsed with a technique. Um, so the, the idea of the slow house is almost feels like a, a, an architecture which draws itself. It's, it tries to be as inevitable as an a, a, um, architectural project could possibly be. Um, it's a continuous arc of movement on a site in North Haven, New York. The site's slightly kinked. And uh, basically, it's a movement of uh, arrival uh, at the site with a car and simply uh, extending that projection of movement to the destination, which is the, the window of view to the ocean at the other end of the house. Um, so it unifies the moments of time and movement and synchroniz uh, synchronization with the interior spaces, um, creates the most efficient trajectory across the kinked site from, uh, from entry to ocean. Um, and it's quite literally uh, the connection of the door to the window. That's, that's all. Another kind of old project is the Slither uh, housing project in Gifu, Japan. Um, and another project that tries to be as, as reductive and inevitable as possible uh, in its creation. It's 105 uh, units of housing um, in a kind of modernist bar building. And it, it attempts to take the kind of banal standardization of housing and to incrementally differentiate every single unit within it. So there's a kind of mass differentiation of the units. So each unit is offset by one meter. They're all rotating 1.5 degrees on the site. Um, and in section, they step up eight inches from each other going up the building. So every unit has its own front door. Every unit has its own window. It has its own elevation of arrival. Perhaps even simpler is a performance called Moving Target from 1996. It's a dance and multimedia performance. Um, and the only gesture of the entire performance uh, as a stage set and the only gesture of the drawing is that single diagonal slash of the line, which is a 45 degree mirror on the stage. Um, and basically, it's a kind of uh, surface that projects media down onto the stage from elevation to plan, and then reciprocally reprojects the action of the actors and the media back to the audience from plan to elevation. So you get a kind of simultaneity of those two architectural portrayals at once with a single diagonal gesture. And again, it's an effort to, in the most minimal means, collapse uh, technique with concept um, and to be as reductive as possible. Perhaps quite different, but in a perspectival space, the, the uh, project Mural uh, at the Whitney um, is attempting to portray with some humor, I would say, uh, this piece, which was an installation, which uh, was only a work of art in the sense that it actually progressively destroyed the gallery space, that the robotic drill moved back and forth and randomly perforated and drew on the walls and kind of progressively destroyed the non-space of the gallery um, and through its destruction converted it progressively into a work of art in its own right. The I-beam marks, among other projects, um, this was a competition uh, finished in 2004. 
which we won, but the project didn't go forward. Um, a kind of beginning of a wrestling match between the kind of digital three-dimensional realm and the conventions of orthographic drawing. Um, and I think it was a kind of productive tango. <laughs> um, the projective drawing by hand imparted the continuous ribbon uh, with a certain discipline, a kind of posture seeking expressiveness without excess, constraining it to a minimum means for maximum effect. A single surface at once unifying and separating the spaces of production within from the spaces of uh, performance. Um, again, the single line now pliable here shearing between the front and the back creates the entire building. Um, and then fast forwarding to the earliest uh, ICA, which hopefully some of you, most of you know. <laughs> um, with the increasing demand for experiential representation to situate a freestanding building in the public realm, the dialogue between digital and hand drawing continued between design that could be distilled orthographically and that which had to be portrayed three-dimensionally. So even at its earliest uh, conception, uh, again, the kind of sectional line, the continuous line of the ribbon that unified the harbor walk uh, and drew it up into the spaces of the building, bringing the public in and lifting them up to a kind of pure gallery space on top uh, was the idea. Uh, with a kind of sheared line, a difference between the ribbon's expression in the front and back. Uh, the plans, again, expressing the harbor walk pulling through and stepping up the auditorium steps into the interior of the auditorium space to the pure gallery box at the top. Um, and the more evolved version of the section um, and the kind of perspective view that you've come to know pre-construction. Um, So the evolved view from the water, the 3D model, pencil construction, 100% Photoshop over the whole thing. It captures the quality, atmosphere, and feeling of the building, never letting you forget that it's a constructed drawing. So that's a kind of arc, I would say. Um, I'm not sure how I'm fully going to connect the dots, but I'm going to try to do that with a couple of projects uh, that we're doing today that are in construction. I would say this approach, approach to project generation begins with the traditional conventions of architectural hand drawing as a means of controlling and disciplining ideas, giving them simple geometric clarity, pairing them back to what is necessary, essential, and hopefully inevitable. As we progressed, as the pencil lines have become more subconscious, more embedded in digital lines rather than an overt signature, um, what remains handy about the work. The cultural ethic and means of practicing endures perhaps in the following ways. First, collapsing or f uh, fusing of the concept and the technique together in a single act. Um, we still ask what is necessary, essential, or inevitable as an idea, and how can architecture embody that without anything more? Um, and I think that, again, that relates to the door that becomes the window, and that's the whole building, uh, or the view projection of the 45-degree mirror, the sheared single line of the I-beam surface seamlessly connecting performance and production, the single sheared line of the ICA um, connecting the space of the public to the space of art at the top. Second, uh, I think we focus on what's at hand constructing buildings that emerge directly out of their site, both physically and culturally. So we're not looking for external personal metaphors, processes, or intuitions to shape a building, but rather all the pressures, the physical, programmatic, and cultural fabric of a, a specific site impose upon a project. So here's a kind of <laughs> Provisional, first draft of a manifesto for handiness. Uh, the hand is literal in its approach to problems. It's practical in its orientation towards the world, dealing always with the problem at hand. It seeks the unexpected invention or discovery through incessantly turning things over. The hand is not above occasional moments of expressiveness, 
while reaching for what is essential. The hand is both an agent and an actor. It is fast, but also slow, instinctive, yet deliberate. The hand can get dirty. The hand is comfortable holding a pencil, a knife, or a mouse. It learns by taking things apart and putting them back together repeatedly. And it seeks to unify ideas uh, and making concept and te technique within a single gesture. So perhaps people in the audience who know our work can, in the Q&A, offer uh, comments or addenda to that. Um, fast forwarding to the present. Uh, again, there's a kind of desire to say what is the connection between the work that's being built today, which is very different in location, scope, scale, complexity, and the media that are used to produce and represent it. Um, and that initial kind of uh, culture of working uh, at the beginning. So uh, the first project is um, the Museum of Image and Sound in Rio. Janeiro. It's uh, on Copacabana Beach, where the red dot is. Um, and the Museum of Image and Sound is actually a cultural museum that's dedicated to reproducing and presenting to both the citizens there and to visitors uh, the history and character of the culture of Rio specifically, which they call karaoke culture. Um, Copacabana Beach is this kind of stunning arc uh, that looks out on the ocean. Um, its char char most characteristic feature is uh, the kind of Burley Marx promenade, which is Roberto Burley Marx designed kind of black and white paving pattern you see along the right hand side next to the buildings. Uh, it's a kind of a democratic space that basically rich and poor go there together. Um, people from this area, people from all over the world a site of tourism. It's a, it's a place where locals hang out. It's a place where people take pleasure in the sun and the sand, but it's also a place where they um, engage in political protest. They celebrate New Year's there. It's a kind of very versatile space within the city. Um, and that's our site, basically looking to the east, embedded in the urban wall, formerly a nightclub that got torn down. Um, and you see that it kind of looks across the Burley Marks walkway across the beach and directly at the ocean. Um, so again, to, to attempt to discover what this building needed to be in the competition stage, we believe that the most important gesture that could capture the building as a whole was to turn up the promenade of the Burley Marks so that the public way, this kind of democratic space, uh, kind of grew the entire building. Um, and again, it was an attempt to find a, an essential, a kind of inevitable gesture that, that seemed like nothing more was needed. Um, and so that was what the building became in its earliest stage. Um, it's a kind of uh, of the DNA of the I-beam and perhaps of ICA, uh, but something that finds its own um, expression here and perhaps even a higher sense of connection and meaning in this site. Um, basically, it's a continuous public promenade all the way to the top of the building where there's a garden and public space uh, at the top. Uh, I'm not sure if my laser pointer works, but oh yeah. So you see the walkway going all the way up to the top, switching back and forth, um, making the, mu the museum ultimately public and kind of of the site. And you see it there kind of situated in the urban wall, a kind of good neighbor architecturally, but also a kind of thing that connects the, the, the beach as a landscape to the kind of expression of the mountain behind. So it feels very natural as a kind of landscape building as well. Um, and though it sits politely within the street wall, kind of uh, going along the, the, the beach and elevation, as you ascend the building going up, it has a kind of a uh, little bit more of a dance to it. It sort of pushes in and pulls out. It kind of becomes more sculptural more expressive, a little bit unruly. Um, and it's a building that's intended to, to kind of inhale uh, the culture and life of the beach both day and night um, so that at the top there's a space that's a public space where there's a garden and a, a place for uh, outdoor cinema. 
So the building contains both spaces of daylight and spaces of media within. There's a lot of the content that's actually presented through interactive media. Um, and uh, so there's an interlacing of, of the daylight and dark spaces. Um, and we kind of further took the, the black and white thematic of uh, Burley Marx to become a kind of program determinant. So that basically there's an interlacing of spaces of daylight with spaces of media, the kind of white light spaces are, are generally for the public um, and they interleave with four kind of large dark spaces which are the galleries of the media presentation of the museum. So four uh, large galleries, the lobby, and then interlacing spaces of uh, temporary exhibitions, uh, education, um, additional uh, presentation, um, this is uh, basically research and then administration. And below grade is an auditorium and a club. Uh, at the top, a uh, restaurant and a kind of public space at the outdoor uh, gardens. The paths that go up the building, uh, the outer kind of public way, is something that largely is continuous and projects itself when it can into the spaces of the interior opportunistically. Sometimes the path of the interior shears and splits so that the, the interior way up um, is in parallel but not identical to the exterior way down. Um, and this is sort of just showing the character of the spaces of the interior kind of filling up the line work of the envelope. Um, again, as it goes up through the building, the, the contents are very determinate so that there's uh, content that's actually about carnival and politics in the dark space alternating with education in the light space. There's uh, <laughs> love poetry in the light space and uh, music and a kind of explanation of samba and choro in the dark space. There's a dark space that's actually about fashion and Carmen Miranda, which is fun. Um, and then the light space is about research uh, and, and so on, cinema, uh, administration, so this is the kind of approach from the beach as you arrive, the connection to the Burley Marx walk that kind of both draws you into the lobby and creates the kind of option for the public way up the building or the museum way up the building at the interior inside the glass line. Uh, at the lobby, there's a sense of the ocean kind of literally washing into the, or the beach kind of washing into the space seamlessly. Uh, we imagine that people will walk in with sand on their feet there's actually a place to wash off uh, your feet so you can go up to the museum above. Um, in this space, the kind of black and white is also thematic. It kind of leaps off the, the floor and engages the space three-dimensionally. It makes the furniture of the places to hang out. It becomes admissions and uh, the bookstore. As you go up the building, the sh there's a kind of shear between levels um, within the building that creates an offset by a half floor, allowing that there always will be a glimpse to where you've been and a glimpse to where you're going in every space that you're in without revealing the whole story all at once. You see as you ascend the building to the second floor, there's a moment again where the kind of, uh, every landing is a kind of connection all the way through the building. So every space is accessible to the disabled, uh, both inside and out. And that's the space of the interior that extends outside at that landing level. Um, again, as you get to the top of the building, you see the kind of exterior stair projecting across into the space of uh, cinema. And that's where the story of uh, Rio cinema industry is told. Um, again, the kind of um, direct projection of the exterior to the interior pathway. And then at the top, um, the kind of outdoor garden space and the public area for the cinema and again the stairs kind of making uh, the differentiation of those two spaces, the view. Down below the auditorium and the nightclub um, are kind of a reciprocal gesture down into darkness. The auditorium is a, a kind of multi-use uh, performance, film, and lecture space. So the next idea of the, the Rio Mis is um, about the creation of uh, daylight and dark spaces and a kind of hope for an invention 
uh, that has to do with looking at the site as its own kind of artifact of the museum. There's a kind of traditional screen that's called a Kobogo in uh, Rio, which is uh, used for daylight screening and ventilation. In this case, we're using it to screen daylight. Uh, but it has these kind of uh, periscopic tubes on it that do the daylight screening. And basically, I oh, might have lost one. Yeah, I did. All right. Uh, there's 20,000 of these tubes across the facade. And they kind of magnetically orient themselves towards views as you move up the building. Um, so as you're traversing the building along the stair on the inside, you get these kind of strange apertures to view that open and close as you go. Um, and the, the site has a kind of panoramic, or the, the building has a kind of panoramic experience of the site. I think that we believe that the, the ocean and the beach are kind of overconsumed images kind of touristically overconsumed to the point where they no longer are looked at closely. And so the idea of this was to actually dismantle, deconstruct, and even kind of pixelate the, the view of uh, each of the features of the site so that as you moved up the building progressively, it reassembles those features, forcing you to kind of sharpen your gaze to look closely to see maybe what you haven't seen before or to renew your understanding of the, the place. Um, and so, say, at the lower levels, as you're moving along the pathway out of the gallery spaces, you're kind of scanning the ground plane and looking at Burley Marx. Um, and that's the section of that happening. As you move up the building, it progressively looks at different aspects of the city uh, and the beach and the sky until the kind of total image of the panorama is reconstructed. Um, and this is intended to set up a kind of dialogue between the dark spaces of of uh, media content within um, that are kind of interpretively presented and the presentation of the site by the building itself as a kind of um, viewing device. There they are being constructed. Um, these are some of the Kobogos before they've been insta installed. The dark side is the interior, the light side is the exterior. Um, and you see them their kind of locations all the way along the major museographic pathways. Um, also, as we work through this process, um, we, I guess I wanted to bring in some part of our, how we actually make these ideas. And so there's an, a, a very precise uh, rhino model that was used to help develop the form work there and to set out the concrete. It's very complicated concrete work because there's a lot of forming that has to happen on under surfaces and things like that. Um, and so we worked very closely with the contractor to figure out how to do this. Uh, and then there was a lot of study and development of specific elements within the building, both the shape of the, the kind of uh, pathway and the ribbon itself, but also the kind of structural elements like the columns that become very, um, they kind of melt from view by being curved and Siamese. Uh, and the building is under construction, it's topped out, and it will open at some point next year, hopefully. So I hope to connect this work to the early projects through a kind of DNA, like a single gesture beginning with the line, um, collapsing concept and technique together, using the fabric of the site, uh, as the, the problem at hand, um, physically and culturally, uh, to make a building which feels as, as though it might have drawn itself or there's something inevitable about it, something uh, necessary, something that isn't, uh, that's self-evident, I would say. That hopefully that even though there's a lot of expressiveness to the building, there's also something that seems like it had to be that way and not another way. A second project, the Columbia University Medical Center in New York, is a project sharing some of its DNA with the Rio Mies and previous projects, uh, but evolving the idea into something quite different, motivated by its site, uh, situation, and program. So uh, this is the Columbia's three campuses. This is the really nice Morningside campus, which everybody knows, Manhattanville, which is uh, Master plan by Renzo Piano, and now under construction, and we have some project there. Uh, but this is the medical campus, which 
um, is maybe it's stretching it to call it a campus. It's a kind of collection of buildings that have aggregated over time and formed themselves into its medical school. Um, and so located along uh, 168th Street and kind of bending up Haven Avenue is what they call their campus. And there's the nursing school, dental school, uh, physicians and surgeons school, and public health. Um, and they're trying to make it into a place, which it isn't really now. It's kind of a collection of urban spaces uh, with urban character. And uh, so we did a competition. Um, oops. Sorry. Uh, basically to, to kind of master plan this entire area to create public space, to redo a couple of their buildings. This is a kind of a quad that would be at the heart of the campus. And then this street would kind of extend north um, and create a new medical education building for them at the, the physicians and surgeons building. Um, and so you see it kind of in 3D here. The, basically, the yellow line is that kind of spine, which was kind of organizing idea of the campus. And our site uh, initially was for a tower building located there amongst those three residential towers. Uh, it's a pretty nice site uh, located up above Riverside Drive, looking across at the Palisades, overlooking the Hudson River. Uh, and you get a little glimpse of it when you're going across the George Washington Bridge. Um, so north being this way, this is the primary approach for students and connection to the building from the south. And then the building has its most gorgeous views uh, to the west. Uh, and unlike most campus buildings, this one was kind of an opportunistic choice. It's a tower with a very small footprint. And so it's kind of unconventional for classroom buildings. Um, typically, programmatically, what you do with a classroom building is put all the public space on the bottom, then put all the student spaces above that, and then put all the administrative offices above that. Uh, initially, we felt because students there spend 20 hours a day in the building that it would be nice to give them the, the classroom spaces above and put the offices down below. And then finally, because they spend so much time there, really make a strong public connection all the way up and down the building, which may be familiar as an idea now. So again, there was an idea of, of making a kind of like turning the street up the building and having a way in which the image of the building and all of its public spaces um, kind of cohere to make a new campus center and a kind of vertical campus model. Um, and so extracted from the building, we call this the learning cascade. And it, it's, it is, in fact, a continuous way all the way up the building, although nobody ever thinks that you're actually going to walk all the way up the building. It's really about a continuous interconnectivity between all of the kind of spaces uh, that, that live within the building. Um, and it really speaks to the idea that uh, in education, there's a belief that you spend six or eight hours a day in a classroom, but you may spend another 14 with your peers hanging out socially, that a lot of learning occurs experientially in unstructured ways. Um, there's a lot of team-based work uh, in this program. And uh, basic collaboration and social exchange is, is almost as important, or perhaps more important, than, than the simple instruction that you receive in a conventional classroom space. So this is a kind of social network that goes all the way up the building and provides an incredible number of varieties of space to hang out, um, to study, to research. So that becomes the image of the building. It's basically the, the activity, the life of the building is the thing that makes the building. And the connectivity all the way up, the inner life of the building is the building. At each level, um, typically in the classroom floors above, there's conventional loft-like classrooms, there's meeting spaces, and then there's the cascade, which makes this kind of seamless connectivity where people easily fall to the floor below or the floor above. Um, and are, kind of always finding their, their uh, zone of ergonomic comfort within the building. And even though the building looks quite unruly and perhaps even disorganized, it actually has a very strong underlying logic to it that's super clear. Because the bottom is three floors of lobby, 
public, the most public auditorium space and a public terrace and event space, which we call the public quad. There's two floors of anatomy with their own kind of social spaces and support spaces, hangout spaces, and call that the anatomy quad. And then two very similar blocks of three floors, which we call learning neighborhoods. And they're, they each have three floors of classrooms, and they have all the same things in their cascade uh, at each level. And then in between is a two-floor kind of uh, student commons. So really is the idea of taking a, a campus and turning it upward. And so this is just to make that very explicit, but commons throughout, food above and below, quiet lounges distributed to each of the neighborhoods, large study areas uh, for each, group study. Hmm. I think I'm losing slides in your Mac. Is there one? No. Yeah. no. Outdoor rooms, outdoor terraces. Uh, Etc. So that there's a way in which even though the building doesn't look like it has repetition within it, there is a repetition of all the spaces. Uh, uh, in addition, there's a way in which this is expressed on the exterior, that the, the kind of public space um, kind of emerges from a, a kind of exterior cladding, which basically uh, takes the most social spaces to the south and progressively veils them towards inner focus at the, the more structured organization. Uh, learning spaces of the north. Um, originally, these were precast elements. They'd become a treatment of the glass. But the idea was that that kind of veil created an increasing kind of introspection across the building. Um, so you see the kind of you know, more social to the south, more fo focused to the north. So quickly walking up the building. Again, the connection to the street, uh, the lobby, the auditorium above, kind of second floor terrace overlooking the, the view to the river, uh, that terrace connecting directly to the auditorium space with its large picture window, which could be switched on or switched off depending on what the needs of the space are. Um, the kind of lower neighborhood spaces, you see again the kind of uh, different kinds of social life and activities that are going on, the ability to be outdoors or indoors, um, the kind of you know, loungy feeling of all these spaces where the hope is that whatever your comfort zone is, you can find that posture within the space, whether you want to be alone or with other people, whether you want to be lying down, standing up, or sitting, etc. cetera. Um, the kind of double height overlooking the student commons, intended to be more socially active again. Um, this is the commons from the outside, and then the kind of upper neighborhood. Uh, again, interconnected with all this kind of variety of spaces, almost a kind of domestic feel, because the idea that people live there 20 hours a day, it should be a very comfortable space um, that's really you know, kind of magnetic. You want to be there. Um, so again, the image of the building is the building, is the inner life of the building. Um, you know, again, we made a very precise rhino model in order to coordinate uh, all of the concrete work that kind of formed the bones of the building inside. Um, and that was what was ultimately used through the documentation process uh, to establish all the work points and the, the methods of construction of this building. And there it is topped out. Uh, it'll be open in about a year. Hopefully, again. Um, so again, with, uh, with increasing formal complexity, it still retains the singular gesture coming out of the site, a digital line collapsing the idea of the active and interconnected student life with its formal and physical realization. It uses the material of the city at hand, gives a visible cohesion to the idea of the campus. Um, and what it looks like is how it performs. The active life uh, of the building is its image. The third project I wanted to show you is, is the Broad uh, in LA, which is also in construction. Um, it's different, I would say, in terms of its programmatic relation to site, but I believe that it shares a strong sense of DNA to the previous two projects. Um, Slide's a little hard to see, but basically that's the site there 
along Grand Avenue in this kind of totally redeveloping area of downtown Los Angeles with Disney Concert Hall directly next door. And it kind of sits next to Disney across from Arata Isosaki's MoCA. Um, and it kind of among this ensemble of many different uh, architects' work, including Rafael Mineo, Coop Himmelblau, and uh, Tom Main and Morphosis. Uh, and the, the program of this is actually not precisely a public institution. It's the private collection of Eli Broad, but he has every intent that it become a lending collection uh, that is works of art that are shown in other museums. They're shown here, and even there's the hope that they will collaboratively find their way out into the public spaces, um, working with other institutions in the area to present themselves to the public. So it's an attempt to make the building have as much of a public life as it possibly can. Most immediately of issue from an architectural standpoint for this project is how to produce a new institution for art sitting directly adjacent to Frank Gehry's Disney Hall. Uh, and because due to the constraints of our site, we're packed into the zoning volume. It's a, basically a cubic site, not cubic, but a, a box. Uh, the program fills up the box. Um, so we'll neither compete with it structurally, and we probably won't compete with it in terms of shininess. But somehow the building has to hold its own while being deferential at the same time. Um, so because it's a building that's all about contemporary art, and it needs to actually absorb daylight rather than projecting it like Geary's building does. Um, we began with the concept that our building would be a daylight absorber, that it's matte, it's porous, it soaks up light, and his is shiny and smooth, and it reflects it. Right? And obviously ours is more of a field treatment, and his is more of a sculptural treatment of the building. The program is about 50-50, very, very roughly, between art storage in a vault and then about uh, the other half being public programs, exhibition spaces, administrative support, etc. cetera. Um, and though you can put art storage in daylight sometimes, it's not a desirable thing to do in general. Basically, in this case, we wanted the highest uh, zero daylight for, uh, cura for art preservation reasons, very high performance uh, spaces to store art in, um, climate controlled, et cetera, et cetera. So basically, the simple diagram of the building is the storage goes down below, the exhibition spaces go on the top, not unlike the ICA, uh, and then the kind of carve out space is the public receiving lobby uh, at the street level. And so we had this idea that, that this would become a kind of solid object, completely opaque again, and then over it would be what we call the, oops, what we call the veil, which is a kind of uh, enveloping surface uh, that brings in daylight from all directions and creates a kind of a perfect daylight space, if we could do that. Uh, and then pre-curated art would be down below, and the idea was that it could easily come up on top and be curated there for public presentation, that the public would enter off Grand Street and kind of pierce through the vault um, and then arrive at the top and then kind of find their way back down again. And so there's the solid figure of the vault. They're carved out to receive the public, uh, and the, the veil kind of lifted away. Uh, but basically, the vault, the top surface of the vault, is the floor of the gallery space, and the veil is everything else. Um, and a little bit more about the veil, basically, the site is actually on uh, 45 degrees to true north. And so in seeking northern daylight, uh, the kind of roof oculi and the, the kind of daylight apertures around the building have to orient themselves in a kind of unusual way on a 45 degree angle. Um, and so even though the infrastructure of galleries within wants to be normal to the spaces of the galleries, the daylight orientation of the skylights and windows to the building all wants to be turned at 45 degrees to that. 
And that sets up the kind of uh, oblique logic of the skylights and apertures going around the veil. So you see that the kind of typical configuration of elements that are oriented looking up from the inside at the ceiling at the skylights. This is a 3D print um, kind of creating opportunities for track lighting and whatnot that's normal to the space inside. And then these oblique uh, lines of geometry that basically are orienting the skylights towards northern light. And that kind of tracks down uh, from the ceiling down the faces of the, the veil. So that ge geometry kind of goes all the way around the building. And you can see it there. It's almost like a kind of a oriented piece of coral that's been chopped by the site so that all of the kind of apertures are always oblique and they kind of change as you go around the building because of the way that they're cut by the site. Um, the veil does lift and you create kind of peekaboos at the corners of the building in order to receive the public along Grand Avenue. Uh, the public is brought into a small lobby area and then shot up, kind of piercing through the vault and arriving very quickly at the top uh, at the public. Uh -oh. well, uh, quickly to the top of the exhibition space. Uh, and you see that in plan here below the small lobby area with the escalator going up, elevator and stair coming down kind of migrating through the building with a couple of semi-public programs kind of opportunistically off of it at the second level and then the gallery above. Free and clear 200 by 200 foot space without any columns and a kind of arrival point in the center. I'm losing a lot of slides here. <coughs> well, too bad. Well, so basically this is the fast way up through the building, the aperture at the top. Um, the arrival point with the, the kind of network of skylights over the top. <laughs> um, say our aspiration for the space, what we wish it would be with no walls. And you see the kind of idea of daylight wrapping all the way around and coming in from the top. Oh, no. Yeah. I'm losing all of them now. All right, well, and so this is the, the image of the building, uh, the kind of corner approach. Can you see them on the screen or no? No, it's because we converted to. Do they show up miraculously? Pull out the USB drive thing? No. That's worse. Oh. Sorry, guys. The wrong one. Oh, Should I pull out the other one? <laughs> You're not taking any more advice today. Okay. <laughs> All right. I may need a little troubleshooter help. All right, so jumping forward, hopefully I'll get a couple of these slides to show, but this is the kind of technical means by which this is realized. The CATIA model, that's all the structural elements and the roof structure, the envelope. <sighs> <laughs> Uh, okay, well, at least we get this one. Uh, so this is uh, basically the precast elements on the exterior, all color-coded by type. So you can see all the different elements of the veil. And that maybe. All right. Well, well, you missed a few along the way, but... Uh, the precast elements in the yard before they get installed, the steel going up for the veil along Grand Avenue, uh, the kind of north western facade, which is actually just cladding the vault. Oh no. This is terrible. Okay, well. Okay, thank you. So how is the Broad handy? Well not, <laughs> well, not about a single thread of continuity. It is very directly motivated by lines of projection of the building's singular attraction to northern light, emerging from the site and its orientation, the concept of the veil collapses, the desire for universal light, 
with a desire for universal space. A single gesture of the envelope attempts to do everything. All right, I will try and do one more. Okay, so this is the final project I want to show today. Uh, basically, those three are under construction. This is a future project. Um, while New York may have more cultural institutions than any city on earth, it lacks a Kunst Hall, a monumental free space for staging unlimited art exhibition, performance, and event that doesn't have its own collection or resident organization. Without the state funding of other international cities, such a Kunst Hall in New York would need to be totally financially self-sustaining and therefore ultimately flexible. Located on Manhattan's post-industrial west side, along the High Line where it converges with the Hudson Yards development, the culture shed will rise, abutting a new residential building, which we are designing, and fronting onto a public space, three levels of column-free gallery space, with food and event space at the roof. Surrounding this structure will be the shed, an infrastructural steel exoskeleton with its own mechanical system and lightweight ETFE pillow glazing. Using port uh, gantry technology, the structure tracks out to enclose surrounding public space to the east, doubling the enclosed volume of the building. The culture shed will open to the surrounding public spaces and load in art events through the loading dock below or an external hoist at the fixed building, permitting multiple parallel events to be staged at once. Performance, exhibition, installation. And in some cases, very large installation. Theater rigging or lighting rigging from the top can lower to create a conventional extensive gallery at the ground floor where blackout shades can lower down to enclose a large volume of space for media. Central theatrical lighting can drop to do a contemporary dance performance in the round. Or twice a year in the spring and fall, Fashion Week can become resident here. Large scale art performance events can be viewed across multiple levels of the fixed building as balconies, as well as from the ground below. And the space can be set up to stage large-scale outdoor musical performances or concerts using the shed building itself as a proscenium for the stage. The shed will open itself up to the High Line. It'll open its galleries to, the, to itself, uh, and it'll open its spaces to the Hudson Yards development, uh, the public spaces at the exterior. Just like the experience of a film from the interior. The building will have a super robust uh, infrastructure up at the roof 
continuous network of catwalks, lighting rigging, theatrical rigging, chain hoists, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Again, attempting to allow ultimate flexibility to uh, stage or achieve any kind of performance or exhibition or event. As I wrap up, I'll just let this play in the background as a kind of geek out thing. Um, so also, the culture shed works with what is at hand, the physical and cultural fabrics of Manhattan's west side as a former industrial port to create a new kind of institution. Like the Broad, its architectural lines of expression derive from its structural and infrastructural needs. In this case, long span, high volume, a kinetic structure, and very lightweight. Here again, the concept and the technique attempt to be combined. A building that can expand or contract as a host for all varieties of artistic use combines financial sustainability with cultural re relevance. I'll let it keep playing, but in the uh, effort to close um, and to try and tie back to the beginning. I argue that there's a persistent sensibility, a sharp, pragmatic, conceptual deliberateness, a quest for the inevitableness of an idea which emerges out of looking very closely at the site, the program, the cultural situation, the problem at hand. Advancing in a sense uh, that the strongest architectural ideas may be reduced in the representation to gestures or drawings with clarity and simplicity that after much manual labor may be communicated directly and simply by the hand. Thank you. Two examples started with the Gary Building and the Scott study. Um, there seems to be an interesting way to lens to see the work too. And I was looking very carefully at the orthographic drawings of a lot of the projects, and I noticed that there's no poche in the way that it's, it's just proliferates. And what I think is going to be Gary and even Grove attempts, so at least the Tel Aviv Museum. Uh, and it's sort of Beyond just the hand drawings, there seems to be a, just a drawing technique that persists. So, and it's very much manifest in the fact that there, everything has a front and back surface. There's no, you know, I think the I-beam is a great example because literally all of the surfaces are used in a very active way. Uh, and so I guess it's just a sort of a hypothesis that I'm kind of working through as you're working through your handy mm -hmm. manifest. I don't know. It's, it seems to be about the, draw, the orthographic drawing more than even the hand drawing, the orthographic projection as a partner or as a kind of test uh, against you know, the, the volumes, the exuberance. I don't, I don't know. It's just that's, that's if I, beyond just the sketches, because it's you know, beyond the hand sketches and drawings, there seems to be a very particular, is, it, I mean, is that something you guys think about? I mean, do you constantly eliminate that? Or is it something that just kind of comes out of the process? Or? I think, yeah, I mean, I think there's a de desire to be fit you know, to not have fat and to have everything have a multiplicity of potentials, um, to have every surface be able to be used. I think in the, in the drawing, uh, maybe if I had more, in the next iteration of this lecture, I would look more at, at, at stronger relations between drawing and the work today, because I think that's a hard case to make overt to people. But I think there's still a kind of discipline to the work that attempts to um, always understand how it's geometrically constructed and almost in the most reductive possible way. So that things are cords and fillets often that, that even when things become three-dimensionally complex, the underpinning, the lines of intention 
are quite um, restrained, I think, if that makes sense, that they're, they're not trying to be flourishy and they're not working beyond our capabilities to, to understand what's in the digital realm that we're operating with. Like everything is, uh, there's always an effort to pare back to the essence. Um, so I, I think that there's not a lot of poche in the work and there is an attempt to use every surface in as many ways as possible. Thanks for coming. Uh, <clears throat> I was just wondering, um, you talk a lot about moving through space, and obviously buildings are all about that. I wonder if you have any anecdotes of uh, when wayfinding has either helped or hindered, or uh, just anything interesting where that has come into play in projects. I mean, we actually have a diagram which we often use in lectures that I didn't put up here today. And it's simply a piece of paper with two red lines on it. And one is a straight line from point A to point B. And the other goes from point A to point B. But it's like a big tangled mess along the way. And I think that our desire is actually to create buildings where there's a kind of inefficiency of movement in the sense that you want to linger, that you want to stay, in the sense that you want to get lost inside the space. Um, and that they offer many potentials for thinking about engaging the space in different ways. So um, that's kind of not answering your question. But I think that, <laughs> that, that the hope, for example, of the, of the cascade, for example, I think that you would always know where to go to get up or down in the learning cascade. But there's still a hope that there's a kind of gradient of experience along it and that everybody kind of moves along that gradient until they find the, the place where they want to be, their comfort space, and then they stay there. You know, or even as they migrate throughout the day to different spaces and different social formations, the, architect is, the architecture is kind of, it doesn't enforce that, but it creates these kind of imprints of potential where people are always kind of um, encouraged or uh, attracted to, to find ways to not get lost, but to spend time to explore. Like to well, meeting halfway, I guess. Can I come back to the hand thing also? And um, thank you. I, I also appreciate the, the desire to frame it. And I also appreciate that I to continue to think about it. And one thing that strikes me is that the hand as a like signature is another way of thinking about hand. Right? And I think also the, because the, the drawing process of the early Dillers video projects established such a kind of signature and a recognizability to that practice. And before you got to the broad, I was thinking, well, is there is there any kind of subconsciousness to describe a new form of signature through this kind of continuous ribbon as um, a new version of the pencil line drawing? I mean, I'm wondering, is there any office because you talk about the kind of inevitability of the pulling up of the pathways, and, but I beam and, and SEA and Columbia and Rio, they all share this kind of continuous ribbon. Like, is that something that's subconsciously in the office that is, that is framed as a design solution that we kind of own this, that this is, right, that this is something that we now is a form of signature. I suspect not, but 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 yet from the exterior that that there, that is something that a core that runs across a number of projects. Yeah? yeah, for sure, for sure. I think it, we didn't own it. I think it, we engaged it and found what we hope were deeper meanings of it or different trajectories to explore it. I think that it did create an armature for for reduction in the sense that it created a you know differentiation of spaces and a connectivity between them it created an opportunity for openness to the public where the public was always connected from <laughs> the street to the building in some way or another um, but I think that we're also you know we don't want to ever be tied down to one way of working. So I think it was a transitional strategy to move from orthographic drawing into three dimensions, and now the kind of trajectories are multiplying in different ways. So privilege is the section, though. Yeah. But you, you know, the, the, the motivator of the projects, which is different than a lot of practices, is that the action is in the section, not really in the plan. Right. And so 
and, and the, maybe the road in the way is the purest demonstration of that, where the whole organizational concept is a sectional concept, is the freehand sketch it shows. And in that case, there is Boucher, half of it is Boucher, and it's the thing that the, the circulation pierces through. So the, the Boucher simply ways is somewhere in the section is a trick. Whether the delimited loops of the ID have allow for a gap or the service can be stuck. There, there seems to always be a search for the poche in, in the in section that I can. And I, I, I'd just like to say, I think that the, uh, it's very interesting that you showed us this last project because it seems definitely quite different than, than the others. And maybe that has something to do with the evolution of the office as a larger thing that's taken on bigger enterprises. But it seems very promising to me in the sense that it's having to take on a, diff a little bit of a different set of issues that are uh, the identity of this Kunsthalle is not going to be maybe as it has to be more flexible it has to accommodate all these different uses and it embraces that it seems like but it seems would you agree that this is a, a, a kind of a different enterprise than the previous three that you showed us in terms of the idiosyncrasy of the you know the, the Columbia school probably the most idiosyncratic yeah, I think that there's a, a maybe, and maybe I didn't chart the trajectory enough because there are certainly other projects that are predecessors to this one that have a lot of, that, that there's a singular space and they have a lot of need to accommodate many, many different functions within a single space. And so there's a kind of automation of the transformation of a kind of, you know, simple volume. Um, uh, I was focused more on the kind of connection to drawing and I more put this as a kind of like a look at a uh, the way you know the structure is very elaborate here but it is it is essential in the sense that it's um, creating the openings that it needs to create spanning the spans it needs to span accommodating all the things that need to be vertical resolving all the lateral loads that come up especially in a building that moves sideways and then stops abruptly and so there's a way in which um, if you if you accommodate all of those things, there's still something essential that's drawing-like that makes this building. It has a kind of three-dimensionality to its elements, a kind of expressiveness, but there's not a lot more elements than you need. But just to pick up on what George said, the legacy is an important point, that one can imagine the Rio project or even the Columbia project with a different architect deploying the same diagram without all the manners, inflections, and the difference all the way up through. One can imagine a dumbed-down version of both buildings, which would make them less rich, less idiosyncratic, but, but also maybe more prototypical as a proposition. You know, that there's a lot of effort made in the mannerism of the difference up through the section. Okay. That's, that's, I would say, the firm's cultural choice with the same uber sketch starting point. But Given the program here, there isn't the alibi to do that precisely because there aren't micro programmatic alibis to allow the difference to happen in this building. So the future unpredictability of this building requires it to be more like Mises' vision of the kind of general purpose convention center or something. And I, I think that that, that that desire through the history of the firm take a fairly simple concept in section and then to work it to a point where it gets quite mannered, it was always the driving sensibility. I guess the link, the link may be more programmatic than it is in any way architectural, I don't know if that makes sense, but that the continuous line that, that shifts has a kind of both continuity that unifies everything within and a sense of continuous difference along it that differentiates everything along the way as well. So. It, it's both everything and only one thing. And I think this is just doing it in a different guise. It's not an architectural way of doing it, it that's related, but it, programmatically it's an attempt to do everything by doing one thing. Um, so I think it's a conceptual link more than it's a, an architectural or drawing link. Um, I showed the belief projects, not the doubt projects today. <laughs> but there's a few of those. I know it's there. Yeah. It was very tight. I mean, I think that, that um, it's very hard to sell ideas to clients. And I think that 
if you rely on the strength of your personality, your ethos, it's very vulnerable. Um, and I think that, that the kind of labor, the relaboring over and over and over again, trying to understand what an idea is and what it wants to be and what seems inevitable about an architectural site and program and proposition, the use of the word inevitable, obviously, you're right, is rhetorical at a certain point because nothing is. You know, five different architects would come up with five different answers. I think that that we try to find what we think is the the rightest solution, the thing that has the least doubt to it at the end of the day. And I think that actually the partner formation and the, the expanding principle formation of the studio is about a kind of <laughs> penetrating a topic or an idea from multiple points of view to the point where all the bad ideas die and the most inevitable ones seem to rise. Um, and so there's a lot of back and forth between intuition and critical appraisal of, of the success of ideas that's happening in real time, all the time. And the story is being understood as, it's, as the dough is cooking, but I think that at the end of the day, successful ones are the ones where you can speak to a client and a larger group of people that you need to build consensus with in order to get them to leap, leap off the cliff with you. And the story important? is what? Just important? I mean, you can be rooting South Down person if you're a sole proprietor, but if you've got 12 talented people <coughs> in the office that you're working with, everybody's going to be swimming the same way. So I, I, well, I think it's also critical because without because somebody probably spent a lot of time where the wheel and all of the things come in, and that person had to believe as much as the person that was working out the stairs on the summit. So I, 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 I think that brooding self-doubt can be a real management problem. That's my <laughs> own perspective on it. But you're, you're concerned at the other. You're concerned at the other extent that there's a kind of fascism of belief, which is that when the belief seems so inevitable, there isn't a margin of doubt anymore about what what could be the alternative or something. That's the extreme case, right? Um, I'm very sympathetic to this way of working. So I'm just sort of trying to think through myself. How do you sort of maintain the kind of criticality while you're working in a mode that ensures yeah. conversion, adherence, belief? I mean, I think one of the things that, that's a founding principle, and, and it's, it's inevitable in practice that you do have certain themes that you explore across multiple projects, but the ideal of our practice would be that every project is a new project. It's a new experiment. It's a new idea. And so I think that there, even if it seems inevitable across several projects that one idea emerges again and again in different guises, I think that after you become self-aware of that inevitability multiple times, you start to say, maybe it's not so inevitable. You know? And I think that that's a moment of critique, where you start to see the work bifurcate and become other things. I don't know if that's too abstract, but I think that, that, uh, that the auto-critique also says that each project should be its own experiment, and therefore the project shouldn't look alike, they shouldn't perform alike. They should be doing different things in response to different problems. Yeah. So I have a question thinking about you know, hand drafting as uh, an earlier part of the firm's work and moving into um, you know, the use of digital models. It seems that, as Tim mentioned, the, the projects were very sectional. And then as the, the projects you showed progress, that idea of uh, sectional project became more complex. <coughs> Um, I would imagine due to being able to use, you know, Rhino as a, a tool now. How do you see, you know, hand drafting or the, the original drawings, you know, as a part of the, the process today? And how is that paired with the use of the digital model? It's a good point. I think that I would say very personally, I still draw by hand a lot. Uh, and that has to do with being partly being a dinosaur, but it's partly the case that, that taking apart a complicated program of a, comp, you know, of a museum, institution, a university building, an embassy, all kinds of things like that, the ability to iterate on it quickly and manipulate it and twist it and look at it from different angles programmatically, um, just simply establishing the underpinnings of the building is much faster by hand, and that's where the hand is fast, I think. 
it's slow than when you get into form and, and kind of the, the expressiveness of the building, the, the kind of complexity of structure and potentially the complexity of spaces. And it begins to place a drag on those efforts. Um, but I also think that that's valuable because sometimes those things are, are a bit facile. And so checking those things, having a dialogue between drawing by hand still and working in the digital realm and working in physical model and other things is a way of kind of validating whether ideas are more or less inevitable, I guess. I think there's, uh, there's something really interesting that happened early on. You went with a scary sketch and the press is kind of going, press is going, scat, going sketch next to it. And then you jumped right away to the slow house, which has like an armature yeah. to it. And when I was thinking back through your lectures, you're talking now, there's an interesting red line that goes from, you know, armature like natural device and goes digital. It goes to all these other ideas, which I kind of found fascinating as a way of like, controlling geometry. Or maybe you read the freehand sketch in the section as something a little bit more loose, but just mounts up the last question is I wonder if you could speak to that a little bit more in terms of you know iterative geometry and how that's used against something that's more freeform. Hmm. In a way that Yeah, can you give me a little bit more? You know, like when you look at a project like this project that's up on the wall now, there seems to be some kind of freeform, almost like sketching ideas that exist with that or even like the shape of the shed itself. But obviously there's also like some geometry that goes in the structure, which is, um, just it probably can't be done by hand in a way that you need an armature to kind of interject that. There's a specific it. moment in that animation, just to help that. Yeah. Yeah. There's a specific moment in animation where it's almost like someone has pulled it, you know? There's that Stretched it. Of, yeah, and that's like, you could almost say like the armature, right? The feedback loop versus the will. Maybe that or yeah, or in the early the housing project where you go like incrementally up by eight inches throughout the entire housing block is you know kind of a moment where I don't know if I want to do like hand sketching or that. That's something that needs kind of some other device. You're getting at the intuitive versus the constructive. Yeah, right. And we get more like the handy that. too. It's like where you go from like a drawing, or you go from a sketch to a drawing, or something that's drafted or digitally created. Yeah. So I think I think. I think Maybe what I was trying to characterize with the lecture is the fight between um, pulling things back and simplifying them towards their highest level of clarity, which may be less expressive than a lot of the work now, and then the instinct towards doing things that are more expressive because they can be, that we can control. We almost don't need a structural engineer anymore to do our work. I'm lying a little bit, but we give them our model, and they can analyze it in an afternoon and tell us whether it's working or not. So we have a lot of latitude to play with structure in a way that we never did before. And so I think that um, the ability to kind of tune both how the thing is performing structurally, for example, and how it expresses what it's doing structurally, and even whether those two things are in alignment or not, uh, is something that we play with a lot now, and it, it's not really doable in the realm of sketching, or it's, it's certainly massively inefficient, whereas the digital realm kind of allows the initial underpinnings, the lines, to kind of thicken and take shape and become much more contoured. And I think that that's kind of where the marriage happens, even if it's sometimes a rocky marriage. That was a rocky marriage, and thank you, Ben. Thank you.